On 5 April 1815 Mount Tambora began erupting on the island of Sumbawa, modern-day Indonesia. By 10 April, the eruptions had intensified. The three plumes rose out of the mountain and combined. The whole of the mountain was turned into a flowing mass of liquid fire. Pumice stones of up to 8 inches, 21 centimeters, in diameter rained down while pyroclastic flows swept down all sides of the mountain, racing towards the sea, destroying the village of Tambora. By the time the main eruption was over, all vegetation on the island was destroyed. Uprooted trees mixed with pumice ash and washed into the sea forming rafts of up to 3 miles across. Clouds of thick ash still covered the summit on April 23rd road. Between October 1st and 3, the British ships Fairley and James Sibbald encountered floating pumice rafts over 2,200 miles, about twice the distance from Florida to New York City, west of where the eruption took place. The eruption of Mount Tambora is the largest recorded volcanic eruption in human history. Over 4,000 feet, about half the height of Mount St. Helens, of elevation was lost from the top of the mountain. An estimated 10 billion tons of material was ejected into the atmosphere, with the effect of lowering the average temperature across the world by 1.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The climate effects were so severe that 1816 was known as, the year without a summer. But just what does this have to do with the bicycle, a machine that is now featured in 22 Olympic events and its own race called the Tour de France with an estimated 3.5 billion viewers? Join us today as we answer those questions with the history behind the bicycle. Although the climate changes of the Mount Tambora eruption were felt around the world, one of the areas where they were most pronounced was Western Europe. Where, in 1817 a young German man named Karl Freiherr von Drees was completing one of his earliest inventions. Born in Karlsruhe, Germany in 1785, Karl Friedrich Christian Ludwig Freiherr Dreis von Sauerbronn was an inventor and civil servant for the German state of Baden. Seeing the death of so many horses due to the rapid climate change over the summer of 1816, Karl Freiherr decided to come up with an alternative to the horse. Karl, a prolific inventor, Having already invented a device to record piano music to paper and two different four-wheeled human-powered vehicles put the finishing touches on his Lauf machine, running machine, in 1817 and had it patented in 1818. Although not completely like the bicycle of today, it is recognized as the first two-wheeled personal transport machine. The Lauf machine was shaped like a modern bicycle with two tires of the same size in front and back with the rider in the middle. However, unlike its modern counterpart, it had no pedals. The rider's feet touched the ground, and they, ran, along the road. Karl's test ride would be that summer, from Mannheim to Rheinai, just over 7 miles round trip. Karl's Lauf machine was made primarily of wood, weighing just under 50 pounds. It had brass bushings within the wheel, a rear brake, and iron shod wooden wheels. Using Baden's best road, Karl was able to make the trip in just under an hour. This was sort of a watershed moment for the idea of personalized mechanical transportation. This also led to the bicycle being a victim of its own success. As the marketing began to take hold, people realized that in 1817 the roads were too rutted to be able to balance the bike for long and so they took to the sidewalks. After being the cause of many pedestrian injuries, authorities in Great Britain, Germany, and the United States banned their use, leading to stagnation in the development of the bicycle. From the 1820s through to the 1850s the bike remained on life support with the idea of two-wheeled personal transport being left by the wayside by three and even four-wheeled personal power transportation.
There were minor improvements along the way such as Dennis Johnson of London who patented not only a new shape, the frame itself was more curved and snake-like than the straight as a board laugh machine, but also two new names, having secured the patents for the pedestrian curricle and the velocipede. Other than that, the design remained largely the same until 1839 when a Scottish blacksmith from Keir supposedly created the first pedal-powered bicycle. Kirkpatrick Macmillan was credited with creating the first bicycle with treadles connected by rods to a rear crank, similar to the mechanism on a steam locomotive. I say supposedly, because while he was credited for more than 50 years after the invention, any information about this came from a nephew in the 1890s. James Johnson, the nephew in question, had the goal in his own words to prove that to my native county of Dumfries belongs the honor of being the birthplace of the invention of the bicycle. The information he presented as to the veracity of his claims was a description that didn't match the actual bicycle his uncle was said to have designed and a design that was a composite drawing of two bicycles that were designed in 1869 by Thomas McCall. The 1840s and 50s were also quite decades in terms of advancement in the bicycle. It wasn't until 1863 that the first widespread and commercially successful design was released. Enter the Velocipede. The Velocipede was of a simpler design than that Macmillan bicycle. Using rotary cranks and pedals mounted to the front wheel, it provided an easier riding experience than that of the rear treadle design of the 1830s. The Velocipede also made use of metal frames instead of wood, lowering the weight while enabling easier manufacturing and elegant design. The credit for the Velocipede is still debated today but there are generally two possibilities for its creator, Pierre Lallement or Ernest Michaud. The only certain thing is that whoever it was, was French. The arms race for the bicycle was on. Pierre Lallement was born on October 25, 1843, near Nancy, France. In the early 1860s Pierre was employed making baby carriages in Nancy when he saw someone using a pedal less velocipede. He came up with the idea to add a transmission with a rotary crank and pedals attached to the front wheel. The frame itself was made of iron and the tires were wood, shod in iron. In 1863, he moved to Paris where he had an interaction with the Olivier brothers who saw the commercial potential in his invention. The three brothers, Amy, René, and Marius fell in love with the Velocipede when they were students in Paris in 1864. Pierre decided that he would try his luck in the United States, moving to Connecticut in 1865. It was there that he filed for the first and only patent for a pedal bicycle, being awarded patent number 59915 in November 1866. The patent included the basic form of the Velocipede with the addition of the pedals as well as a metal spring under the seat to make for a more comfortable ride. Pierre worked for several years in America but couldn't find a manufacturer interested in producing his bicycle. While he was working to get the Velocipede off the ground in America, the Olivier brothers were busy in France. Having gone into business with Pierre Michaud and his son Ernest in 1968, the brothers were responsible for the first big bicycle craze in France. Pierre Lallement returned to Paris in 1868, just in time to see this craze take off. First to France, then to South America, and then to the country he tried to entice with the bicycle for years, America. Pierre Michaud and his son Ernest started making velocipedes around 1863, utilizing a design very similar to that of Pierre Lallement. The most notable difference was the frame which was serpentine in shape and two pieces of cast iron that were bolted together. 
It was this frame that caused the partnership between the Michaud family and the Olivier brothers to fall apart. In 1865, a blacksmith from Lyon invented a new type of frame that was a single piece of angled wrought iron. This frame was lighter as well as much stronger than the bolted-together version the Oliviers were selling. It wasn't until 1868 that the Oliviers realized their serpentine, two-piece, 45 kg frames needed to be changed. By this time the damage had been done and by 1869, the partnership with Pierre Michaud and the French craze for bicycles was over. The fire died rapidly in the United States as well. Even though England was the only country to maintain its love of the bicycle, it was a Frenchman again who provided the next leap forward in design. The high bicycle was the next step in the evolution of the bone shaker. The name bone shaker being popularized in the United States and England for obvious reasons. It was in 1868 that he received a patent for wire spoke wheels, massively improving the speed, while lowering the weight, and easing the manufacturing of a bicycle. Speed was the primary reason the high bicycle was developed. With a front wheel that was larger than the rear, the speed was only controlled by how long the rider's legs were and how fast they could pedal. As their popularity in England grew, they gained the nickname of the penny farthing. Which in England, the penny represented the front wheel, and a coin of a smaller denomination, the farthing, represented the rear. While fast, the penny farthing was totally unsafe. Riders were moving at great speed and high in the air. If they lost control while riding the fell, hard. Riders would often break both their wrists trying to brace for a fall, get their legs caught under the handlebars as the penny farthing toppled, and even die due to injuries. As a result, the high bicycle became the realm of adventurous young men almost exclusively. Due to fashion at the time, women couldn't even get on one to ride it, and the older more refined gentlemen preferred a tricycle instead of a penny farthing. One such gentleman was James Starley, considered the father of the bicycle. James Starley, born on the 21st of April 1830 in Auburn, England got his start as an inventor early in life, when at the age of nine developed a rat trap using an umbrella and a branch from a willow tree. In 1859 James joined the sewing machine manufacturer of Newton, Wilson, and Company, working in their factory in Holborn. It was only a few years later, in 1861, that James went into business with Josiah Turner, one of the partners of Newton, Wilson, and Company. The two formed the Coventry Sewing Machine Company. Turner's nephew brought a penny farthing into the factory in 1868 and the rest was history. The Coventry Sewing Machine Company soon turned to producing bicycles. Some of the advancements that James brought to the bike were ball bearings, solid rubber tires, and a hollow steel tube frame. These all made for a huge leap forward in shedding weight and rider comfort. He patented tangential spokes in 1874, giving more strength with improved lightness. During his time working James made several different versions of personal transport, including chain-driven tricycles designed for women and couples. As James got older, he found it harder and harder to ride his tricycle with his son. The tricycle design was a side-by-side -side design, with each rider responsible for pedaling their own wheel. With his strength fading, there was no reliable way to steer as his son was stronger than he was. It was during a ride one day when he is reported to have said, I've got it. Jumping off his tricycle and sitting down with a cup of tea, he soon invented a differential gear, allowing the tires to be turned by averaging the speed of the two riders. This was Saturday evening. 
By Monday morning at 6 a.m. his factory was creating a prototype and by 8 a.m. he was on a train to London to register the patent. Though James died in 1881, his family didn't stop innovating the bicycle. John Kemp Starley was the nephew of James Starley. He started his working career with his uncle building penny farthings but soon went down his own path. In 1877 he started Starley & Sutton Co. with a local cyclist William Sutton. The goal was to create bicycles that were safer than the penny farthing. They began with making tricycles but in 1885, everything changed. It was the year they created the Rover Safety Bicycle. The Safety Bicycle is the first that would resemble what we know today as the bicycle. It was a chain-driven, rear-wheel drive bicycle with tires that were the same size. These made it far more stable than the penny farthing. The magazine, Cycling, said in an article that the company had set the pattern to the world. A phrase they used for many years in their advertising. So impactful was the design John Kemp Starley came up with that even the size of the tires, at 26 inches, are still common on bikes today. As we hit the 20th century, the bicycle's popularity once again began to ebb and flow. With an increase of popularity in Europe and a decrease in the United States. From 1900 to 1910 the automobile became the preferred form of transport in the United States. By the 1920s the bicycle was relegated almost completely to being considered a child's toy. In Europe on the other hand popularity grew and improvements continued. The French were still at it when, in the early 20th century the derailleur was invented. The device was attached to the chain on the rear wheel of the bicycle allowing for bikes with multiple gears and easy changing of those gears. Things remained the same in the bicycling world for almost the next six decades. With America considering the bike to be something of a hobby item and Europe broadly considering it a tool and item of utility. It was in the late 1960s when American perception began to change. The population began seeing the benefits of a healthier lifestyle that included exercise as well as a more fuel-efficient way to travel. The vast majority of Americans preferred the European-style road bikes, popularly called 10 speeds to anything America was selling at the time. The bikes imported from Europe and copied by American manufacturers led to the bicycle boom of the 70s. Annual US sales of the bike doubled from 1960 to 1970. It only took them five years to double again by 1975, when they reached their peak of 17 million. The next big change in the biking world would happen in the early 1980s when the mountain bike was released. The mountain bike itself was a design that featured a sturdier frame, wider knobby tires for better traction, a more upright seating position and as time went on, more suspension both front and rear. The United Kingdom adopted the mountain bike very early on, preferring its wider utility to some of the road or cruiser bikes they had been riding. The trend soon followed around the world. By the year 2000, mountain bike sales had outstripped all other types around the world. What does the future hold for the bicycle? If history is any indication, there will be no end to the improvements in the multi-billion dollar bicycle industry. Already in the 21st century technology such as computer-aided design, finite element analysis, and computational fluid dynamics have come together to make components lighter and more aerodynamic without sacrificing strength.
It seems that after more than 200 years, this wonderful machine is going to keep us moving into the future. Thanks for watching.